And then in 2001, um, the, the whole grouping was, was disbanded. And I would contend that that particular skeptical position died um, at that point. Um, you know, that was the last uh, really uh, strong defense of that. Um, and yet, somehow, the media still implies that there is a lot of doubt around, implying that this argument is still quite evenly balanced. But in 2004, there was a, a very extensive study done of, of every academic paper written in um, peer-reviewed scientific journals about global warming. There was a total of 928 scientific papers, and not one of those disagreed with the consensus that climate change was, was happening and that it was largely the result of anthropogenic emissions. The next skeptical position I'm going to talk about is this one that I hear quite a bit, which is, um, how do we know this isn't just environmentalists exaggerating? And the argument goes, well, you know, these Greens have been predicting the end of the world for decades now, and, and it never happens, and so on. And I think the best way of responding to this is by looking at this book, uh, which I'd really highly recommend by Jared Diamond, called Collapse. And what Diamond does in this book is that he, he looks at a whole series of civilizations it, it, throughout history that have prospered for a time, and then they have collapsed. And um, he, he draws out of those examples common factors. And it's normally one or two or sometimes three of these factors that, are, that, are the result, um, that produce that collapse in, in the civilization. Um, and you can see that these look very familiar. You know, overpopulation, deforestation, soil problems, water management, climate change, et cetera, et cetera. And at the end of the book, um, Diamond argues that Whereas a lot of these collapses that occurred in the past were limited by the geographical regions, so such as you know, Easter Island or the Greenland Norse or the Anasazi Indians, now that we're a, a very globalized society, if a collapse were to occur, it's, it's likely to occur on a, a much broader scale. But I think that the really key point that he makes is that um, these kind of collapses have occurred in the past. And so there's every reason to believe that if, if we carry on with business as usual, we'll experience a, a similar collapse in the future. I think the other point to make is that um, increasingly it, it, we're seeing fairly sober types who are making fairly alarming uh, statements about climate change. It's, it's not just hysterical environmentalists. So this was Lord Stern um, speaking at the RIBA towards the end of last year, where he said that these are big risks of a planetary catastrophe and bear in mind that I was brought up to understate things rather than exaggerate. So the, the next skeptical position is, is this one. It's not up to architects to tackle climate change. And I'm going to uh, talk about this uh, graph, uh, which perhaps looks a, a little boring, but it is worth getting your head around. This was the result of a very detailed study by the, uh, the management firm McKinsey. And they assessed all the common methods of carbon abatement in terms of their cost and their scope and how, how um, possible it was to implement those. And all the stuff that is below the line is stuff that would actually save money, and then the stuff that is above the line is stuff that would cost money. So you have things like uh, building insulation, lighting systems, air conditioning, uh, water heating, fuel efficiency in vehicles, and so on. And then going through to the much more complicated things and more expensive things like carbon capture and storage, photovoltaics, and so on. And what you can see from that is that nearly all the easy, quick wins that would bring about the biggest carbon reductions for the minimum investment, nearly all of those are to be found in the building industry. So as, as, um, as architects, more often than not, we are leading the design team. We're the, we're the lead consultant. Uh, we initiate a lot of the ideas. We coordinate the work of the other consultants. And although occasionally we do get overruled by clients, on the whole, Clients hire architects in order to advise them. And, and generally speaking, they will listen to architects' advice. So I, I think architects are uniquely powerful, actually. Uh, we're arguably one, one of the most powerful um, characters in the, in the industry. And certainly, if you compare the, the potential that we have to make a difference with other professionals, like you know, doctors or lawyers or whatever, you know, there's no comparison. There's an absolutely vast amount that we can do. And there are some very promising schemes that have been completed, passive house schemes that have achieved a 90% reduction in, in energy use, um, Bed Z, uh, which was designed to one planet living standards, and um, the, the example of Woking Borough Council, where they managed to achieve 70% reductions in carbon emissions and um, save themselves 5 million quid 
uh, during the first 10 years. And they did that by, by implementing all the easy wins first and then using those savings to work, work their way further and further up the graph. So I, I feel there is a very strong case for saying that architects can take a, a, um, a lot of action on climate change. Um, that's, that's just a, a shot of one Brighton, which is the scheme that in a way followed on from BEDZ. This is one that bioregionals just completed in Brighton, um, built to zero carbon standards for no extra cost. And then this is the Wessex Water um, Operation Center by Bennett's Associates, the highest BREAM rated building ever. Um, only about 3% more than standard cost buildings, and it uses a fraction of the amount of energy. So there are a lot of very positive examples of, of schemes that have been built that, that show we can do a lot. This is getting into one of the more difficult uh, skeptical positions. There are higher priorities for us to tackle than climate change. And the most vocal proponent of this position is a chap called Bjorn Lomborg, who some of you may have heard of. He, he wrote a book a while ago called The Skeptical Environmentalist which in many ways was a sort of full-on assault on the environmental movement. And it, it claimed that all the, all the data had been exaggerated and actually pretty much everything is getting better. We've got more food, less starvation, um, et cetera, et cetera. And um, more recently, uh, Lomborg set up a grouping called the Copenhagen, Copenhagen Consensus. And that was a grouping of, of some of the world's top economists, in, in his words. And they set themselves the challenge of saying, Okay, just supposing we had $50 billion to spend, how could we spend that to achieve the greatest possible global good? And they assessed 16 different things, and they came to the conclusion that climate change was the lowest priority on that list. And right at the top was things like tackling HIV AIDS in Africa, water projects, malnutrition, free trade, and so on. And initially, their arguments do sound quite convincing, and they've certainly been... Um, rather too successful in persuading governments to de delay action on climate change. But if you actually look into it in detail, you find that um, a lot of their arguments start to fall apart. Um, and firstly, the, the figures that they're using for um, the carbon cost benefit analysis are, are way out of date, I would argue. They, they use a figure of $2 per ton as the, as the damage done by emitted carbon. And, and just one example, Stern reckons the figure should be about $85 a ton. They also assume that it costs at least $20 a ton to cut a, um, a ton of carbon dioxide. And what we saw from that McKinsey cost curve is that there's a hell of a lot that you can do that actually saves money rather than costs money. But I think um, another problem with their uh, position is that, that that choice between either tackling uh, problems of developing countries or tackling climate change is, is really a false dichotomy. And here's one reason why it's a false dichotomy. Most of the um, persuasive models for how we could bring about global reductions in uh, carbon emissions 